Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for um, taking the time to come in here. Um, as you can see, we are here for a little flight school. We have some simulators. If you need any, any flight training, let me know. I work here as a flight instructor. Also, we have the water at the end over there where the airing is right now. Also, there you will find the key for the restroom. And the restroom is upstairs, so you have to go through the red gate onto the street and the first left and unlock the door and then you'll see the restroom. It's a little bit complicated. So thank you very much and uh, we're so happy to have Boeing Field here, uh, the controllers, um, and also SeaTac people here. And uh, let's start. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jelka. Good evening, everyone. I'm Kevin Nolan. I'm the uh, air traffic manager at uh, Boeing Field. Along with me, I've got Ryan McCarthy, who's a, a longtime air traffic controller there. Some folks back from uh, Sabroach. I've got Matt Walletner, who is also a pilot. So if I start speaking air traffic control really, really well and get you guys confused, he can help translate for me. Also in the back is Aaron Rose. He's a member of the Local Safety Council at uh, Seattle Approach Control. He's also here to go ahead and answer any questions you may have. And uh, I've also got uh, Dean Allen, who is a member of the Boeing company and might be able to answer any questions from a uh, pilot's perspective that, that flies into Boeing Field and uses the local airspace and has seen and actually had some of the TCAS events we're going to uh, discuss this evening. So with that said, I'll go ahead and get on with the presentation. It's a, a fairly short presentation, but it's, uh, it's designed to go ahead and hopefully uh, get some, uh, some interaction and conversation going, because certainly dialogue is really, really important. You guys don't want to hear me drone on for 30 or 40 minutes and do a data dump and, and download. So there's certainly an audience participation portion of the presentation. I look forward to, to the interaction. So what are we here to talk about? Uh, we're gonna, gonna talk about uh, and raise awareness, hopefully of uh, TCAS events in the local Seattle area. We've got a lot of airports that are kind of closely spaced. We've got some interesting topography and some challenges with that. And uh, interconnected flows between Seattle, SeaTac Airport, Boeing Field, and Renton. So we'll, we'll discuss that. And then in the audience participation part is explore some possible mitigations. You know, certainly myself, the controllers, the, the folks that work over the tray we can come up with ideas and solutions, but hearing and getting more input into those and, and brainstorming and hearing what you, what you guys have and what you guys see from your perspective is really important to us. So that's kind of the purpose of the briefing this evening. Um, RAIS, uh, RA is a, is a resolution advisory in, uh, in TCAS terms, and you can see Boeing Field circled in red. We uh, have approximately one TCAS resolution advisory for every 48 flight operations by TCAS equipped aircraft into or out of Boeing Field. So we're certainly way at the uh, higher end of the spectrum. You've got Santa Monica, SMO, you've got Alliance Field, AFW that are a lot higher than us, but Boeing Field is kind of on par with uh, like Morristown, New Jersey and Van Nuys. So that, that, that's an end of the spectrum we really don't want to be at. We don't want people to become desensitized to TCAS. We're flying to Boeing, we're gonna get one. It's normal operations. So we're gonna go ahead and, and try to explore some different uh, possibilities on that. Um, as you can see with uh, this chart here is showing you the, the correlation by month. Obviously there, there's a seasonal issue here and you can see good weather. There's more VFR folks to go ahead and interact with the, uh, the TCAS equipped aircraft. And this is uh, two years. There's been approximately a 7% increase uh, from 2013 to 2014. Uh, this data is taken from SIAS. So every <coughs> aircraft with a transponder is picked up by the Mode S antenna and is pinged every, uh, every time around by the Mode S antenna. And if they've had a, a TCAS RA, even if the pilot doesn't tell us, the Mode S antenna downloads the information from the aircraft and then we're able to get some, uh, some generic information from uh, different sources that way to kind of find out where are they happening, when are they happening, and, and then we can make some assumptions based on that. Yes, sir. I'm a little rusty. Can you just say what TCAS is? Sure. TCAS, TCAS, TCAS is, is a terminal collision avoidance system. Okay. It, it, uh, based on an algorithm, and it will help pilots identify where targets are. It, it's likened to a fish finder. So it's got a, a radar presentation. 
location. It'll show you where other aircraft are operating in your vicinity. If you start to get closer to an aircraft, it will go ahead and, and let the aircraft up and start issuing a traffic advisory. And then based on the algorithm, if it appears likely the aircraft are going to get into confliction with each other, it will issue an advisory and tell the aircraft to climb or descend to get out of the way of the other aircraft. Yes, sir. But that's all aircraft based. That's not, Correct. That's not coming from Correct. Yeah, that, that's all aircraft based. And if both aircraft are TCAS equipped, then they'll actually have a coordinated maneuver to tell one aircraft to climb, the other to descend in the current version of TCAS. And again, I'm not I'm not an expert at TCAS, but but Dean back there from the Boeing company can certainly uh, help fill in the blanks that I'm that I'm leaving behind in, in reference to TCAS. So so Dean, feel free to speak up, please. Good question. These are aggregate numbers that with seasonal variation. Correct. Do you know if the ratio one in forty eight has seasonal variation? I am not sure to tell you the truth. That, that's based on the and mm -hmm. So I'm okay. not one other question about the data. Yes. Do you have any breakdown as to which are based, uh, locally based uh, aircraft versus visitors? No, 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 we don't. But I do have some slides that sort of show you the locations based on the seasonal, you know, broken down per quarters, you know, fall, winter, summer, and spring. Sort of show where the folks flying into Boeing Field are more apt to go ahead and get a TKS. Uh, well, that's not just people that are aware of their space and are used to it. Right. Any other questions about yeah. this? Is it possible to get a TCAS RA when both airplanes are all following correct procedures, and both where they should be at yes. the right time? Yes, okay. it is. So one of the things that, that we do, we issue a traffic advisory and safety alerts. And so we'll, we can have people in the, uh, the downwind to our airport, and we do have closely spaced parallel runways. The center lines of Boeing Field are only 375 feet apart. So we could have uh, an aircraft departing runway 13 left, and a TCAS equipped aircraft departing behind them off of runway 13 right, issue the traffic, traffic is in sight, the aircraft off the left runway can be making the left downwind departure, but when the uh, TCAS equipped aircraft rotates off the right, they can still get a resolution advisory. And the same thing further out too on the final approach course, you could have an aircraft in the close end downwind, the aircraft has the, the inbound aircraft in sight, mm -hmm. you know, it's been issued traffic, traffic's in sight, and you can still get a TCAS resolution advisory. Can you get them between SeaTac and Boeing as well? Like some guy VFR is on the Vashon departure. As, 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 a, matter, as yeah. a matter of fact, yeah, yes, we do. And we've got some, some data about that. We'll go ahead and talk about that. In fact, 30% uh, of uh, SeaTac's uh, RAs are caused with interaction with Boeing traffic. Okay. Which is not a number we like to see. But that doesn't necessarily mean the Boeing traffic was where they shouldn't have been. Correct. And sometimes they might be, but they might not be. Correct. But but I will say last fall we did have a spike in pilot deviations. Okay. Where people did penetrate the Bravo. And one of those resulted in a near mid air collision and three others were pilot deviations. Okay. Certainly having smaller aircraft in close proximity with larger aircraft that are potentially weight generating is, is not something we want to see. Mm -hmm. Just so like we said before, with the, the uh, parallel runways that are a, still could be issued, and yet we're kind of ignoring it because we are on the right path. Um, but is it, part of the high statistics for one field part of the fact that the, uh, the runways are so close? That, that some of it, some of it is again uh, the, the flows. We've got the topography. So down to the southeast, as I, as I move forward. In fact, we'll, let's go ahead and show this. So I, I don't know if you can see this clearly or not. Uh, in 2013, every time there was a uh, the transponder denoting a uh, resolution advisory, and here it's in orange, and in this one, it's it's in blue. So in, the, in winter 2013, we had 28. In winter 2014, we had 38, and you can kind of see the locations. You know, certainly we've got some close in, which is probably uh, situations like we've discussed. We've got some also that are farther out. Um, sometimes we've got people that are transitioning the airspace that may or may not be talking to us when they're outside of the Delta surface area. And or may, may or may not be talking to Seattle Approach, getting VFR traffic advisories, and they are interacting with the TCAS equipped aircraft, creating a TCAS resolution advisories out there. So, so you want to just take a second and clarify that there's a TA and an RA, and what, yes. those, what those are? Yes. Yeah. So, can, so can, can you can do you have the statistics available for what the algorithm is for a TA versus an RA? How many seconds? Uh, no, I don't. The uh, it is based on time. It is time of closure. And it's also looking at just general proximity. So it's a mixture of two things. Uh, TA versus RA, think about uh, what that was. I'll get that for you. Though. Which one is closer? The RA versus the resolution advisory than the TA. Oh, the, 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 the TA, correct me if I'm wrong, is just, a, just an, a, 
announce a vehicle travel. It's not necessarily any, there's no instructions That's for right. the pilots. Correct. You give them no guidance. Right. TA, TA is benign. Yeah. RA gets some positive guidance. Right. Yeah. TA is the traffic alert. And then the RA is the resolution advisory, oh, okay. actually telling them how to take evasive action based on closure rate and the proximity of the two aircraft. So this is, you said it was a 7% increase. Is that uh, due to maybe uh, greater uh, uh, number of flights being flown? Uh, so the IFR traffic down in Boeing has gone up. Also, uh, with the cost of the equipment coming down, there's also a larger percent that are being equipped now with TCAS. Mm -hmm. But again, certainly we don't want people to become desensitized to, to what's going on out there. So the TCAS is software telling you to do X, Y, Z, not the controller. Correct. Yeah, it, it, it's actually contained in, in the aircraft. Okay. It's automated. Yeah, it's automated. Yeah, based on, on other aircraft transponders. And, and in Seattle, because we're underneath the Bravo airspace and within 30 miles of Seattle, we're within the mode C veil. So people operating in this airspace are required to have an operating yeah. transponder with mode C. But are, is it also true that whenever the, the equipment on the plane issues a TA or RA, RA, that's being sent to Boeing Field or to SeaTac? That's how you're collecting the data? No, no, no. So oh, it, go, it goes yeah. to the MODAX antenna. So okay. the uh, the antenna that, that we use in the radar room to go ahead, it, it sends the signal to the MODAX oh, antenna, okay. and it does not tell us at all. Oh, okay. but it is going down to the Earth right. station there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes, yeah, goes yeah. down to the end of the MODIS antenna, and then uh, we've got uh, some folks back in Washington, D.C. at our, our headquarters and contractors that work for our headquarters okay. that can then go ahead and do the data mining. For so us. those blips are fully automated. It's Correct. not like some pilot said, hey, my alarm just went yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is actual data from TCAS equipped aircraft okay. that had their transponders reported having an RA with, with another aircraft. Mm -hmm. And again, because it's de identified, we don't know was traffic issued. What, what the exact specific situation was that involved that. This kind of gives you an idea, though, of where they're likely to occur. Mm -hmm. And, and it was a, a typical month in the wintertime. And again, this kind of shows the, the increase, and it kind of shows where they're at, too. Like I said, down, down to the southeast, anyone that's flown into Boeing Field has seen the topography down there and know that we've kind of got, uh, got a challenge between the Renton Airport just to our, uh, our east, you know, SeaTac to the west, you know, rapidly rising terrain. In between the two, got some helicopter routes in there. We worked hard to go ahead and kind of push them off the final approach course. But honestly, they do still keep the aircraft. So, Certainly keep in mind different possible mitigations that we can discuss as we move forward with the presentation. Again, it shows, it shows the, uh, the, the seasonal change, and you can see now 165 in 2013, 129 in uh, 14, but again, they're, they're all strung out nice and right along the final approach course, more or less. Summertime, what, what do we do in summertime? We leave Boeing Field and where do we go? We go out to the San Juan Islands and direct is pretty much right out the localizer final approach course and that's probably not a really good area to be flying mm -hmm. unless you want to interact with a fast moving aircraft. And, and we all know seeing a void doesn't always work. So something to consider. In fall, and again, it drops off in the fall. I, I will say last fall, we did have a spike in, uh, in, in uh, interaction with the uh, on, your, on your chart there. Yeah, right over yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. It's right up there? Yeah. yeah so, so this is LA Bay right in here. It's kind of 
hard to see LA Bay with all the TCAS areas, but it's, it's approximately right in this area. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah. But it doesn't appear, it doesn't appear that it's associated with SeaTac traffic at all. No, SeaTac uh, traffic, it's going to be more uh, in the shelf right, right around here, so in the close in downwind with the Vashon departure. Doesn't happen as much as SeaTac as it does going up. And again, this this is just showing the uh, the the Boeing uh, TCAS RAs. This mm -hmm. is not showing any of the uh, the SeaTac mm -hmm. RA traffic. Pilot deviation is when a pilot acts unpredictably or against uh, against, I, I, against air traffic instructions, or he's violating airspace. So this kind of shows you the, the different type of intruder aircraft that are generating the, uh, the TKSRAs. So about 60 of those are interaction with, with other Boeing traffic. Again, we have IFR traffic inbound, and if uh, folks are flying outbound along the localizer, going to uh, go to Orcas Island or Rosario out there in the uh, islands, you, you have to have an interaction with uh, another Boeing traffic that's inbound. Same thing to the south. I mean, we've got helicopters inbound and outbound. We have traffic in our pattern that can also interact and cause a TCAS RA. So 60% our traffic, 23% um, from transient traffic. Some of those could be the full plane operators into an outbound uh, out of Lake Union in Kenmore. And some of those folks don't know for sure. And about 97% are low performance general aviation aircraft. And again, low performance has a more difficult time getting out of the way of a faster performing aircraft. So certainly something to consider when we get to the uh, interaction. Could you, another way of saying that, could you say that it would mostly be FR folks and not I, people on flight plans? That'd be valid, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, most, most of them are going to be VFR traffic. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little late in getting here. Are sure. both with Boeing Tower? Yeah, I'm, I'm Kevin Allen, I'm the air traffic manager at Boeing Field. Yeah. With me is Ryan McCarthy. He is one of my air traffic controllers and a longtime uh, member there at Boeing Tower. Okay. And we've got some folks from uh, Seattle Approach Control in the back. Uh, both uh, Matt Walner, who's uh, traffic management, Aaron Rose from the local safety council, and then uh, Dean Allen also was uh, kind enough to join us from the Boeing company, who he and I have worked on some other mitigation strategies in the past for, for, for team. Is there any requirement of uh, a top of someone in the tower actually, let's say, on the 150 on approach to, let's say, 13 left and then coming in for a landing? Okay. And well, this actually did happen. and. I'm coming in and I'm fairly close to landing the aircraft on the runway. And a 737 lands next to me. And I delay my approach and sure, certainly I'm glad I did because I, if I was on the runway, it probably didn't cost. I, I actually was just a few feet above, I accelerated because I was hit by weight turbulence. Weight turbulence. And I didn't, there was no mention that he was coming in. Uh oh, well, I'm sorry <laughs> to hear that. That was, that was about a year ago. But okay. anyway, yes, I, I, I was hit pretty hard too. Yeah, so, so we have. We can do simultaneous same direction operations between small aircraft or light or small aircraft and light twin. Okay. Uh, 737 and, and a single engine should not be using the runways at the same time. Okay. They could have been they could have thought that maybe I was gonna land a little bit faster. That that could be so so I I know 150. So I will say we are at a training facility and we do have probably about uh, twenty-five to thirty percent of our workforce is uh, developmental controllers. So, so please, uh, I, I've got a stack of business cards here. I will leave them here. So if you guys have any questions or concerns about the service you get into or out of Boeing Field, please feel free to give me a call. We do take our job very seriously, and we, we want to know how to, how to make it better. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So uh, Seattle, you, you can see that uh, we do have some interaction with Seattle also. Uh, arrivals, departures, the, the, the blue line is, uh, is interaction with, uh, with our traffic. This is, I know as an adult, I learn better seeing stuff visually than I do just seeing seeing words on paper. So, uh, Boeing traffic, transient, interaction with Renton, and then red is a SeaTac, and the little one at the top is, is other. So transient means like that's just flying in the area that is not correct. And you're correct. talking to ATC to may, do may, may or may not be. Okay. So uh, again, the, the folks off of Lake Union, the float plane base mm -hmm. out there, they don't have to talk to us. They're outside of Class Delta. Mm -hmm. They can just transition. Um, we get a lot of folks this time of year that want to go ahead and do tours over downtown. They're just mm -hmm. 
transitioning the airspace that, you know, if they're in the Delta, they're required to talk to us. Outside of the Delta, they may or may not talk to us. I've okay. seen a lot of discussion about that in the Facebook forum they have for the uh, flights in the area. And everyone's recommendation was to talk to Boeing Tower and notify the intentions, even if you're out of the Delta. I think that's Please, really yes. Good. Yeah, well, we, we, really we strongly encourage that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here tonight is to strongly encourage you yeah. to take that message back to, to the folks that you work with. I don't know how many people are flight instructors. But you know, certainly talk to your aviation community and, and, and please get the word out. We hear that on the radio a lot, but you don't hear the ones that don't do it, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So th this is the uh, this kind of the CTAC portion here. Um, this kind of shows you where the uh, IFR flights are apt to uh, to be at and what altitudes they're going to be descending to. Unfortunately, from this distance, even from as close as I am, it's kind of hard to read. But uh, so I'll, I'll uh, kind of tell you from the uh, from the uh, northeast in the south flow up here. There we go. They're going to be uh, 3,000 sending down to 2,200. 2,200 is the initial uh, approach altitude for our instrument approaches in the south flow into Boeing Field. Um, down here from the uh, southwest, uh, 11,000 dumping down to 2,200. Again, 2,200 being the initial approach altitude. And uh, from the south, 1, 3,000 down to 2,200. This is a typical day, one hour's worth of... Uh... Uh, yeah, I wish I could say it is. Um, <laughs> no. I think it's eight hours. <laughs> 15 minutes. It does say. It's on a, obviously a very, very busy IFR day into a Boeing Field. But that shows you where the flight tracks are at. And, and certainly you can see the concentration of them right there in... Uh, in Elliott Bay, as well as along the final approach course, where we have correlation with the other slides that show where we're getting the TCAS RAs out the final approach course. So, mm -hmm. yes, sir. Just how many poster size of that image right there posted up at my FBO, and I think that would be that one picture would be worth a thousand words. Okay. Yeah. If uh, if you can give Jellica your email addresses, I will. Uh, Take some of the data out of this and, and, and try to give you uh, the best possible pixel size for some of the other stuff and, and go ahead and email it to her and she can distribute it. Thank you. So the next one is going to be a, a North Flow Day. So again, you can kind of see where we're out there along the final approach course. Here's Renton. We kind of passed Renton right here. Remember, we had a little bit of interaction with Renton, but more likely. Uh, we've got the helicopters that we interact with in the North Flow, even though we've we've pushed them a little bit further east, we still do have some interactions. We've got some interactions close in. Um, from the uh, north, northeast, 10,000 descending down to uh, 2,000 feet, 2,000 feet being the initial approach altitude in uh, North Flow. Arrivals from the northwest, 7 down to 2. From the uh, south, 8,000 down to uh, 2,000, once they clear the, uh, the arrival path is at SeaTac. So that's, this is where you can expect to see the uh, the IFR traffic in the North Flow. Before T uh, TCAS, were these patterns obvious before as well? I mean, did you yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this is based on actual transponder data downloaded from, I believe, what we call PDARS, and, and so these are actual flight tracks. Um, these aren't TCAS equipped aircraft. May or may not be TCAS equipped aircraft. This is all the aircraft that flew on an IFR flight plan. But the hazards we're talking about, the... the, the they're the same. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're the same. They were out there, we just weren't as aware of them. So now that we're aware of them, it you know, certainly brings up our awareness, and then we want to go ahead and figure out ways to go ahead and mitigate yeah. what's going on out there. So when they're coming up the valley, they're, they're sharing the exact same location and altitude as VFR pilots yeah. on the valley. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little, a little higher. A little higher. Yeah, because yeah, coming up the valley, I mean, pretty I'm, I'm pretty low, but it's 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 obvious it's an increasingly constrained yeah. sort of cone. Yeah, the funnel. Yeah, yeah. the funnel's all right on in there. Converging over the south center. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's but, like 1,500 or so in the yeah. valley. Yeah. yeah. They can't be much higher, much higher than that. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you've got the helicopter traffic, and you've got all sorts of stuff that's interacting right uh -huh. there. So yeah. that's certainly a hot spot and something to be aware of. So TCAS events involving uh, Seattle traffic, we kind of brought it up and touched on it earlier. Uh, about 30% of uh, CTAC's arrivals have 
for 30% of the arrivals in the south flow of SeaTac traffic have a TCAS interaction with traffic off the Boeing field. Um, so usually it's involving the Vashon departure or the right downwind departure. Uh, so we'll, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the Vashon, but Seattle has had a significant increase in traffic and traffic is still going up there. So not only is traffic increasing at Boeing, but also the fleet mix is changing. So if you have uh, an aircraft that gets into a close proximity with a Seattle arrival, before it might, it might have been a, a Dash 8 or an MD-80 or a 737, now there's certain times of the day where it's going to be a 757, 767, heavy Airbus, 787. So their fleet mix is changing, and they're getting a lot more large aircraft. So heavies are going up. And they're going to get more of the new international terminal. Yes, they are. Yep. So it's only going to get more important that we go ahead and fly the Vash on departure correctly. So how many people fly into and out of Boeing Field that are here? How many people know about the Vashon departure? Excellent. How many people know what the Vashon departure says? <laughs> yeah. How many people know how close the Class Bravo airspace is when you're flying the Vashon departure? Very close. How many, <laughs> yes. how many people have had a pilot deviation because they've not quite followed the Vashon departure correctly? I want to ask that question. Don't worry about answering that question. But I will tell you that the class B airspace is right above us. I mean, it is really important that you follow that thing verbatim. Uh, back on the back table, I did bring a stack of the Fly Quiet brochures. It does have the Vashon departure in there. So so please, please look at it. Please read it. Please know. really good that the controls do at the Boeing Field is they, they sometimes ask if you're uh, if you're aware of the Vashon arrival. Or if, if they catch somebody that's really, uh, you know, doesn't really know what they're doing, they usually confirm that. Yeah, exactly. So based on the spike of TCAS events we have yeah. and pilot deviations with uh, with with folks interacting at SeaTac, we have if someone says we want to write down a departure or the Vashon departure, we will ask them, "Are you familiar?" Yeah. We want to help you. We're, that's what we're there for. We're we're here, we're here to help prevent you guys from getting yourselves into trouble and, and having an issue with, with the folks at SeaTac. That's a core thirty airport, and they, they do big business, and you know commercial airliners are, are big business. So we want to. We want to make sure everyone is operating the system as safe and efficiently as possible. And that's what we're all about. So if you don't know what the Vashon departure is, uh, if you've got some questions, please feel free to ask. I will tell you also that we like to have people come and visit us. We're really lonely up there. So if you want to come by for a, a, a tour, again, I've got a stack of cards there, and I will give Jellica my contact information. In fact, she's got my contact information. So we welcome uh, opportunities to have folks come visit us. Uh, bring your students by for flight instructors. If you're operating an aircraft into or out of Boeing and you want to stop by and visit, uh, please call, set up a tour, and we'd be more than happy to go ahead and uh, accommodate that. How many people would, would you limit? Uh, usually small groups of, what, about five or less is usually what we what we try to do. Okay. 15 to 30 minutes is probably about enough time. But, you know, we, we can have this fairly small facility, no more than eight to ten, ten being, being the upper end. Yeah. Right. Pretty small power. It is. It is. How much advanced notice do you need? Uh, usually just a few days. You know, uh, right now I, I'm without a secretary and uh, without a staff person, so I got to make sure there's enough controllers that I can pull somebody off the operation and have them give the tour without creating a distraction, or make sure that I'm available to, to give the tour. So. Considering how low we are over it's West the Crest the Park, you know, the West Seattle Reservoir residents there, I mean, you see how low you are and how, how not very high above their homes. Do you get a lot of complaints from those folks? Because actually, no, they, they're not really. Good because, yeah, 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 yeah they, they all love planes and stuff because yeah. I would stay there myself. And, right. Yeah, yeah so, so, so there, before this yeah. was the uh, Vashon departure and the uh, Lake Arrival, it used to be the uh, White Center and Three Tree, I believe, were the, were the names of it. Way back when. Yeah. So it, it's been in existence for a while. People are used to the flight tracks, and noise complaints are very, very few. Okay. If they read their title report, <laughs> how close the airport was. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 exactly. So yep, this, this is verbatim out of, out of the brochure. So Annabelle 800 turn uh, to the west of being the airport traffic control tower, remains yeah. south of uh, the reservoir. The reservoir has been covered over, so it's now West Crest Park. So it's not quite as clear a reporting point as it used to be, but it, it's still out there. So again, if any of you uh, come up with any other ideas where it might be a good VFR reporting point out there for a 
a chart of the procedure, please let us know. It sometimes it's confusing for new pilots because you say report reservoir mm -hmm. and there's a green field yeah. and you're yeah, supposed yeah. to know yeah. about yeah. Right. Or brown field. Yeah, yeah. 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 brown field. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, maybe we could change it to West Crest Park as opposed to and now you're going to confuse all the pilots who've been flying it for the last month. <laughs> I've, I've been trying to do two miles west. Okay. And then I get some pilots go, well, I know where the reservoir is. Or I'm ridge, like, oh, ridge of the hill or something wait. like that. Yeah. You can just say two two miles west at the reservoir. Yeah. <clears throat> where the, uh, uh, the community college, uh, I think, is is not that hard to spot as well. But it's a couple hundred yards north of there. Just don't use West Crest Park. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's a lot of phraseology I'm trying to spit out. I have no idea where that is. I know that. They should <laughs> rename it Reservoir Park. Yeah. yeah that would be great. <laughs> that would make it easy. Too easy. So this is this is right here is a graphical depiction. Um, working with King County, th this is the link to the, uh, the Fly Quiet brochure where the batch on departure and arrival procedures are located. Uh, it's kind of hard to find. That's why I brought a large stack of those. That's why I put the uh, link here in the presentation. Uh, King County is going to be redoing, redoing their website. Mm -hmm. So they'll move it forward, hopefully to the first page. Right now you gotta go to four pilots and kind of dig around and it's on a little link off to the right, as opposed to being really, uh, really clear and visible. But King County will be modifying that and making it easier for everyone to find. We're also going to go ahead and work with the flight procedures to get the uh, Vashon departure procedure charted on the uh, Seattle Terminal Area chart mm -hmm. to also help raise awareness. I mean, folks like you, I don't worry about as much. It's more the transient folks that aren't from here that are wanting to get themselves in trouble. So we certainly want to make sure that we get the word out there that there are large turbojet aircraft out there. You can get yourself in trouble. We don't want that. We want everyone to be safe. So, what's in it for me? We spent a lot of time talking about TCAS. Why are we talking about TCAS? Safety. Yep. Safety's part of it. What else? Well, it's relatively new. I mean, coping with something that you're trying to make the system or make the process adapt to this, this new resource. You've got, a, you've got a great tool. How do, how do we deploy it so we're successful with it? Right. You know, everybody wants to win. Exactly. I mean, so so safety is a piece of it. Uh, if you have an interaction with another aircraft going into Seattle, you're going to increase the carbon footprint if that aircraft goes around or a Boeing field. You know, certainly costs a lot of money to operate those large aircraft. So everyone is pretty environmentally conscious. We don't want to go ahead and increase the carbon footprint if we can avoid it. Well, if the other alternative, of course, if, if the incidents continue to uh, increase, is uh, more regulation. Right. right. And that's... Right. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's anybody's uh, desired result. No, no. This no. is the devil we know. Exactly. And <laughs> kind of like we touched on with, uh, with the Vashon departure and the spike in pilot deviations, no one wants to get a call from FISDO saying, hey, you, you violated this departure procedure or you violated an inner traffic clearance. And, you know, it's, it's no fun to talk to those guys, quite honestly. They're, they're, they're good people, but they've got a job to do, and, and certainly they do it well. So now for the now for the fun brainstorming piece. How do we avoid operating in, in close proximity to TCAS equipped aircraft? <laughs> Given the constraints that we have, we've got topography, we've got interconnected flows, we've got closely spaced parallel runways. So how do we what can we do to go ahead and mitigate some of the issues? You have, you only have two choices, at least in terms of planning, I think, is you have a horizontal and you have a vertical. And I, I suspect there are people who are paid to look at the data and say, hmm, look at the, the preponderance of the, of the incidents and say, maybe, do we need to change a path? Do we need to, uh, do we need to uh, offset things? I, I, I don't know. I don't know who makes those kind of decisions. Those, oh. are, those are the only tools that I think that are available to you if topography, yeah, you're not going to move mountains. No. Are there times of the day that are the, the busiest and the most I mean, those, those events that happen, are they correlated? Was there a pattern at the time of the day? I mean, maybe there could be something about distributing. I mean, our biggest uh, traffic times are around 7 in the morning. We get a lot of the heavy jets coming and going. And around 7 in the evening, a lot of the heavy jets coming and going. And that's where regular traffic. But there can be just sporadic 
yeah. following Prime, the users, yes. right? Departing at some random time. Mm -hmm. it, that is really tough to call. But those right. are the definite busy time. There's several cargoes coming in. Do the flight schools know these busy times, and would it be? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I tried to go and feel my instructor more than about the, the cargo hour. Yeah. <laughs> I think as, as pilots, we all need discipline. So if we think five minutes ahead of the aircraft and stay on that heading and the altitude, I think that will help a lot. I don't want to say to blame the pilots only, but if we have the discipline to, to learn how to control that aircraft, and stay ahead of the time. That's how I, by the way, I teach my, my students. So discipline, every five minutes you should know what's next, what's next, am I on the heading, am I on the altitude? And if I'm not, I better talk to somebody and report that. I, I'm unable to maintain the altitude because of a strong outbreak, for example, or something, I don't know. I think to answer your question, I mean, we're, we're preaching to the choir to a certain extent here, but right. there, there are established procedures Mm -hmm. uh, we all should know them and should follow them, and we should work with the professionals uh, who we're talking to over the radio to ensure that we are both aware of those, following those, and if there's some unique situation that, that occurs, that we follow instructions. So with that said, I think the big issue is that we all know that there are people who don't, and there always will be a small demographic of pilots who don't. And so that's, I think, maybe what we're talking about. How do we, how do we reach tune the system that? such that we can um, have enough of an element of safety to factor in the fact that there are going to be people who aren't talking to you or fly too high or too low? I don't know what the answer is. But, yeah. I, I have a suggestion. Um, and I, I know that, that this may be a challenge, but um, you know, the brochure that was just handed out and, and the, the piece that's posted on the website um, I believe that that all falls under the rubric of the Fly Quiet program. Correct. Uh, and while I understand that that's, that is also an important initiative that we all want to be a part of, it would seem to me that the safety aspect of it should at least be presented at, as at least as high, equally high a level as that. Yes. And I know that for maybe political or jurisdictional reasons that it, maybe that's why it has to go where it is now but if there could be an alternative path to it that people who didn't care about how loud or or or, unle or friendly they were could more easily find it yeah and that's, that's one of those one of the reasons why we're working with five procedures to get it published onto the uh, terminal area chart yeah. to make it more visible for for those folks that are, are so so the biggest concern in that chart i'm sure you can see it is this this flight path right here and i've talked about this before this is part of the noise abatement procedure for Magnolia area. Right. And during the middle of the day, it's really tough when you're coming up here for you know, chill show and you're supposed to come around the West Point and enter through the bay for this fly quiet program, how you're causing a lot more RAs or this traffic means. around this area here. So yeah. it's best when you call it chill show, we'll enter it so south low, make it straight in once we left, once you stay east of the main center line, fly right over here. Yeah, this is what the county puts out for noise abatement. The other procedures over here, these look pretty good. South, there's not much we can do down here, but this is this is a tough one. Unless there's no traffic, if there's no traffic. This is just fine. There's a lot of IFR traffic inbound. This is a tough one to, for me to like. If you if you <laughs> offset, we we talked about this a little bit earlier. If you offset the uh, instrument arrivals to the west. There is a visual approach, uh, a visual approach that goes. Well, I'll say, but you're you're still talking instrument mostly for process. Can you can you? I mean, would moving the localizer a few degrees to the west change change your uh, your the uh, those numbers at all or those the, the interactions? So I, I know that, that uh, moving the localizer probably, probably isn't realistic, but looking at a, a GPS uh, arrival approach, similar to what uh, Greener Skies is doing with SeaTac. And having a curved RMP approach is something that is being looked at for uh, for the future. Uh, I can't tell you exactly where it is in, in the great scheme of things, but that is one of the one of the things that's being considered. Uh, a metroplex airspace redesign would help uh, for VFR pilots when you're flying on the downwind departure and you're heading on out 
don't fly up on the localizer. I know that thing is a really good navigational aid to follow, but if you could offset from the localizer, knowing that you know certain times of the day, especially there's going to be inbound traffic. Uh, talk to air traffic control. You know, we, we certainly will go ahead and give you traffic advisories. Seattle Approach Control would like to go ahead and give you traffic advisories as well to keep you safe and to prevent those TCAS RAs and go arounds from happening. I mean, there's a difference, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rodrigo or Dean, if if you're an alerted pilot and you know that the traffic is out there, you've been issued the traffic, you visually observe the traffic, and the traffic is restricted from your flight path versus an unknown target. Is that correct? Most of the time. Okay. Actually, last week we had two uh, TAs and one RA as we don't close it. I mean, it was one flight. It was one and a half minute. <laughs> okay, <laughs> two or three. So, uh, um, and our SMS, we have filed already uh, seven RAs this year. Um, so, it's for us, it's been steady. You know, I haven't decreased that much. Okay. What's the reason for that? It's not unreasonable to expect uh, uh, certain performance or have performance expectations or uh, pilot proficiency expectations for flying in the class Bravo airspace. I mean, a 30 mile veil is already your indication that you're changing. You're not not out in the middle of uh, Wichita, Kansas, or something. Right. Um, I think uh, the, the conduits you have available to you are clear, clearly the flight instructing centers around the uh, biannual flight reviews. The uh, I don't know how much more you could specify about it, but um, considering the numbers that you're showing and no fatalities, um, that's pretty remarkable. I think. Right. No, we we do a, a good job issuing traffic, but but no, that TCAS is specifically an instrument to avoid aircraft from colliding with each other. Sure. And that, that's exactly why it is in the aircraft. I mean, it was developed back in the late '80s, early '90s, when shortly after the Paco strike, as a as a tool to go ahead and help aircraft from not getting together. What about minimizing the north the uh, straight out departure as much as possible on the north? Yeah, so I, I know we've, we've asked aircraft to go ahead and, and offset to the localizer when we when we see them heading out on the localizer. If we're talking about departing traffic, we may ask you to offset yeah. just to get out of the way so they don't get an RAO on that too. And they, they don't get so nervous about it as well. And to keep you away it's from the turbulence. As, as much as possible. I mean, there might be downwind traffic inbound from the north and west too. It's, people, um, people fly with their lights on. Is that. Is that uh, Seem to be standard operating procedures in the in the class during the, You're talking about during the day? Yeah. yeah. It, it's nice, especially when it's close proximity to Dallas traffic. Mm -hmm. It helps people a lot to spot aircraft. But of course, then it's really only if they're facing them. In the daytime, your other you know, the lights really aren't going to be that visible, but your main landing light is mm -hmm. very visible straight on. Ken, have you heard anything of that proposal that came about? Two years ago, that meeting that we had at the uh, Air Museum uh, about making VFR uh, uh, charter, GPS charter departure charter procedures. Departure. No, no, I haven't. In, in fact, uh, thank you for bringing that up. So, yeah. So that, we so so we did have an, an SMS meeting a couple of years ago. So SMS is the safety management system because we recognized that this was going on in our airspace. So we, we got a bunch of, of, of experts together, kind of brainstormed as well there too. And one of the proposals had been to develop a charted GPS departure procedure into and out of Boeing Field. <laughs> Nothing has come of that yet. However, flight procedures, I uh, will get in touch with them since, since they're already working on uh, charting the, uh, this one. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, I know we did earlier, Blake versus Vashon. Yeah. Like when you call it one, when you call it the other. and The departure procedure versus yeah. the arrival. Yeah. Okay, in south flow, it's the Vashon departure going out to the west. Mm -hmm. And you read it there, it's close in right down and out or below 800 feet until you're right. in the control tower and then turned out to the west. In north flow, we call the Blake departure. And it's essentially the opposite course. You know, basically, this also shows really the Blake arrival. When, if you're coming inbound, this is uh -huh. south flow, you want to go Blake Island, call and go inbound and fly this route. And this is the Vashon departure. And for North Flow, it's about opposite. 
but really it's it's kind of just like I left, see. left crosswind to Blake Island for the Blake Department. So the, yeah. But the Vashon arrival is going to be North Vashon coming inbound, fly this route the opposite direction, come in and land. So the idea is that you're going to have two streams no matter what. One's going to be over north tip of Vashon, one's going to be over Blake, mm -hmm. and the difference is what direction they're going depends on whether you've got one three or three one active. Right. Okay. Would I be correct? I have a vague recollection that years ago they were just all, it was all called Vashon arrival, Vashon departure, and at some point then, I don't know, this was maybe five, ten years ago, that then the, the Blake terminology was introduced to maybe differentiate between them, but I guess probably about seven or eight years ago okay. they put in the Blake. I remember, okay. It's right when I started there. So would, would it be correct to assume that that what was then the the, the Vashon departure uh, was is now a Blake departure? Essentially, it's just a terminology in north, change. In north in North Flow, we call it a Blake. If three one is active, it's a Blake right. departure. Right. So is it was there a, was there any change other than than the terminology change. I don't know. I wasn't really here then. Matt, no. you remember? No, no we just changed the words. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. So we, we did update the pilot brochure recently, and it used to talk about the clover leaf. The clover leaf in the Vashon departure was a little bit further south. So now we ask you to come up to a being the airport traffic control tower before you make your turn westbound on the Vashon departure. Unless the tower clears you to turn beforehand. Right. Which they use. Well, in the south flow is really unlikely for us to do. I mean, yeah, unless you get an early turn out, we, like just south of the tower you want to turn. That actually helps too if we have no traffic. Like and no that helicopter. turn is the crosswind turn, correct? Crosswind turn, yeah. correct. Okay. Take a right crosswind. Yeah, we might approve an early crosswind. We'll even say that too. A lot of people will early cross improve. Run around right there. There you go. And I think it's also yeah. important yeah. to recognize that the, the departure south for the bash on departure, the reason you do be down into the beam of control tower is you don't want to get into the surface area of the broad airspace. Right. right. Yeah. You need to go far enough north. Right. And the separation requirement is one airplane is in class Bravo and you're not. But they're descending on that flight profile into SeaTac, and the further south you get, the mm -hmm. the tighter those tolerances get. Mm -hmm. And so, especially when there's a heavy jet involved, so we want you on the downwind to be in the tower to get a little bit of buffer. That's why we use 800 instead of 1100, because mm -hmm. you know, the the floor of the class draw was actually 1100 feet. So you got to get down so that there's some margin of safety in there. So so if the Seattle traffic flying the you know, approaches into Seattle, bump that up a, I mean, they're doing three degrees now. Yeah. What, 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 what convention or what, what restricts FAA from changing a three degree glide angle to three and a half, say? So but, it's, it, it, you know, uh, the airplanes are, can only do so much too. In fact, I, I don't remember what the glide slope angle is in Boeing. Didn't we lower it? No, it's, it's three degrees. So, so, so through history, I mean, the the seven oh seven variants used to do two and a half degree uh, degree glide path, and then at some point it became three. Um, but I, I would think that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most of the airplanes flying today could probably handle a three and a quarter, three and a half degree glide path without much difficulty. Maybe. So, well, the airplane might be able to do that. There's also a reduction in capacity because you're carrying more energy than when you land. So they're trying to make three degrees the standard. And also with aircraft carrying speeds from the northwest, the higher descent profile you have, the less stable of an approach you have for IFR traffic. Um, so I would, I would agree with you if you're talking five to eight degrees or something like that, but I... I'm, 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 I'm having a little difficulty buying into you with a, even a half degree, I, at least in my experience, but I, again, I'm not a, I'm not a chart. Well, a half degree is pretty significant. Uh, and then certain aircraft autopilot limitations, uh, exceeding three and a half degrees on the glide path, you have to disengage your autopilot at higher altitude. So not significantly higher, but it'd be higher than it's typical, say a cap one approach, for example. So suddenly you're disengaging the uh, autopilot in IMC conditions uh, on an initial approach to minimums. I'm, I'm just looking for solutions. I'm just trying to throw no, out, throw out an idea. So here, I'm running back to the airspace map, and you can kind of see it's very grainy, but there's this little piece right here, and it really right goes right over our runways, ends right here. And that the class problem right there starts at 1,100 feet. 
So that's why we say at 800 feet, and you cross the ridge line over here, right on this line at 1,000. And you really don't want people getting closer than like 200 to pass Bravo, because I used to fly it tight, and I had a couple of instructors say, well, you need to give a big buffer. The transponder could be three and a half feet off. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what altitude will the uh, jets coming to SeaTac will be at the uh, in that 1,100 foot area? About, about 2,000 feet, between 1,800 and 2,000, depending on what localizer they're on. Very close. So there, there is a little bit of buffer in there. And I forget what the numbers are because we did look at raising the localizer, the glide slope angle. Actually, both, lowering Boeing and raising Seattle. And the numbers were not, I can't remember what they are, but the, the, the risk, risk reward was not there. So we stayed with the three degree allowance. Thank you. Yeah. But seeing that you know the incident of uh, uh, RAs happening is to the northwest of Boeing Field and to the southeast of Boeing Field, so isn't the solution to direct VFR in small underpowered aircraft? You know, away from that area? And yeah, well, that's a procedure. I mean, it's just going yeah, to so cause you have further. So, you want to do a westward that you could actually do? No, we, we tried prohibition in the, in the yeah. 19th <laughs> century. Look how successful no, it is. It's just, uh, just going to push you out. I mean, that's something that we've actually talked about before about, you know, okay, if you want to go out here and you're doing left down, and okay, now over North Merchant, way over in East Downtown, it's taking you way out of this light path that you want to go. No. Maybe you want to fly around downtown, get a sighted at no. a beautiful day like today. As long as you don't extend the center line. No. But, but that's a pretty sharp line, so if you're taking off on 3-1 and you offset to the left half a mile, you're not one of those dots right. anymore. You know? but we don't want to have to make everybody do that, though. No, I, we don't I want to do that's one of the things yeah. that we don't want to have to do. I just, you know, I just like to avoid the big steps. And I don't if you want to do that, if you want to go out and you say, I want to go east of the city or I want to go out west, you know, if you're departing 3-1, you go, hey, I want to just go out high west and get so out of everybody's just, way. Yeah. Rather than saying, yeah, let us know. And that's usually okay with us. So you want to go east to downtown. I'm actually attending a northward departure, but I'm doing it from the Vashon departure. Coming up over. So, so do they have, the incidents go down, of course, by, by time of day. So that period between midnight and 6 a.m. is pretty, uh, that's pretty clear. Right. Yeah, <laughs> there's a solution. There's not a lot of you want to fly? You want to fly on Boeing Field? Right. Hey, all operations from midnight to six. Yeah, never so love that. Yeah. yeah. Or you make like airport landing and takeoff fees change depending on. Uh, oh, don't okay. give many ideas. <laughs> so we don't we don't control that. That would be yeah. yeah. Uh, that'd be King County is responsible for for that over Boeing Field. Maybe there could be an incentive for flying at night. For <laughs> just being able to. It's gonna be. That's more accidents. Bigger. Beautiful downtown, with all the lights. It's the gorgeous. inside of this beautiful scenery and color. Sure, absolutely. I know that like traffic on the highway, it just takes a few cars and all of a sudden everyone's coming to a stop. So just being able to shift the numbers a little bit from these busy times could could be enough to really increase that margin of safety. Yeah. And I don't know what the what the appropriate or realistic incentive huh. would be, whether it's for flight schools or some of the charter guys. I, I think okay. I think just having people have a greater awareness of, of the procedures and and following them and knowing the trouble spots is probably a lot easier to implement than than some kind of incentive program. My, my concern is uh, there'll be some fatality along here, and then the yeah. response to it will be, will be some sort of enforcement or regulation or some change. And not much of an. We, we we've tried all the adaptation we can. We've exhausted everything, and the only thing that's left is hammer out some new rule. Yeah, it, it may not even be a mid-air collision. So I'll tell you, when we had that spike of pilot deviations last fall mm -hmm. in the interaction with SeaTac, they were really wanting us to not have anyone else go out to the west. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of emphasis at that point in time that really needed to be placed on the Vashon departure to make sure people stayed out of the Bravo, stayed beneath the traffic. Still could get a TCAS RA, but not climb into the Bravo airspace. So, yeah, it might not even take a, a mid air collision that, to, to trigger a significant change. I think another thing that's important to realize is that the flight paths haven't changed significantly in the last 30 years since I've been doing air traffic. What's changed is our technology. And so now we're taking this IFR tool, the TCAS, which is designed to measure closure rates with IFR aircraft, and it works beautiful in that context. 
and it has saved us in some cases uh, where we've missed something. We've taken an IFR tool and we've applied it to a VFR airspace. And so in a VFR airspace, we're operating in a sea and void environment, and we operate in tighter tolerances. We're dealing with a, a different type of aircraft. And then you mix a 767 in there with his TCAS capability, and he sees you doing what you've always done. And 10 years ago, he didn't have the equipment. We issued the traffic, he says, oh, I see the guy. And he just keeps on coming in and he lands. No harm, no foul, because he's operating in a vehicle environment. Now he's coming in there with company policy that says when, he, when you get a resolution advisory, you must respond to it. He issues the traffic. They may or may not see you because little Cessnas, whether you believe it or not, are hard to see in a big jet when you're trying to you know, uh, fly the, the aircraft. That goes off. He responds to it. And the worst problem we have is the guy on the localizer south flow in Seattle responds to an aircraft that we already have have him separated from, a little 172 on the downwind, which gives him an RA advisory and he climbs into traffic that we had him separated with. Mm -hmm. And now we have a double go around from something that was already separated. That's where our problem comes in. So the way, the only way we can, there's two prongs that we can do. One, we can talk to the users, the UPS and the heavy jets that operate and even, even the Boeing company, because they get most of their I don't know what your numbers are, but you get most of your RAs in places like Boeing because they come in and out of here. And uh, you go into Moses Lake, you don't get the get the the, the same numbers, right? Um, so we we're asking to consider a TA alarm. One of you guys mentioned it. The TA gives you the traffic picture, but it doesn't give you a, re a resolution device. Doesn't give you a Algorithm. Command guidance gives you no command. It guidance. gives you no command for correction. Right. Uh, that's one. The other one is to let the VFR pilots know this is where they fly. You go back to that poster picture you were talking about. This is where the airplanes fly, and know that they're there. Know that right over the middle of Elliott Bay, they're at they're at sixteen, seventeen hundred feet on glide slope. Maybe at altitudes. I mean, yeah, you could. Yeah. You could, you charts, could do that right off the awesome. first plate. Okay. You know, they're going to be. Right in that confluence right there, we're all joining, that's 2,200 feet. And uh, that's where they're gonna be. So when I teach my students, you cross that localizer out there by chill show at less than 1,700, because you wanna have at least 500, that's the IFR separation requirement. That's still gonna set off the TCAS, because it's set for parameters of 800 to 1,000 feet, depending on closure rate. And again, I don't know all the details of that. So, so you wanna be off the localizers. But then that also creates a problem because of now you're getting in close proximity to the buildings, and we all know what the obstruction clearance requirements are for flying over downtown Seattle. You know, you can't be at a thousand feet, so you can be under the traffic and then right next to the Columbia Tower. You know, that, that violates another rule, right? So you, you, you just have to be aware of what's going on, but it has to be on both sides. It has to be on the TCAS equipped aircraft and the VFR pilot. But somebody else asked a question earlier. Are we doing, are we violating the airspace? No. Everybody is operating by the rules. We just have a piece of equipment introduced in the interest of safety that is uh, creating some alarms. And these have always existed. We just know about them. We're just now getting really good at noticing. And, and they're being reported. And they're being reported. Yeah, they're being reported. So, and it's good data and it's a great discussion. So, uh, I'm a, I'm a fear for the uh, resolution advisories of enough uh, Boeing airplane go around. There's a certain fuel cost for doing that sort of uh, maneuver. And airlines going around, there's a certain cost for that. I, I don't want that pressure or that economics to start being a factor in, uh, in di dictating the, the ability of people to go out and fly airplanes. At least not yet in this country. I hope not. I hope it doesn't come at that point. Right, wait till the drones start getting. getting, <laughs> getting well, that's, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you seen those around Longfield, by the way? Five miles to the northwest. There's a company that's got a, a certificate of authorization to operate a drone just outside of Class Delta, the surface area. But they're at or below 200 feet. Company that's, uh, that's but, that's but, but at, <laughs> at or below 200 feet. So uh, no impact to our traffic that we've seen. Which is the good news. Uh, Seattle Approach has seen one down by McCord. Over we, we've actually had several reports.
courts. Um, I believe the rule, and, and Kevin, you may know better, I believe that you can operate a non-commercial drone, remote control vehicle, below 400 feet. That's right. You know, but you have to, you can't be in airport traffic areas and things like that. Um, but below 400 feet is is known. I fly remote control airplanes. I didn't know that, you know, and, and, and now I do. But we had one at 1,500 feet. Um, the Spanaway, there was a couple months ago. Yeah, there was one down there. There was one right off of Boeing Field um, at 1,500 or 1,800 feet. There's another one uh, at Arlington at like 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, it was one of those quadcopter things. And uh, a guy was doing an approach at, to avoid all the traffic. And, came in contact with a, with a drone. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they, they're just reported to us. And uh, and those those get a lot of attention when, uh, when we get the, those sightings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A really great discussion. Any other uh, questions before we wrap this up? I had a slightly related question about <laughs> doing, coming in on bash on approach. Mm -hmm. I've done it many, many times over the last few years, and one out of all those times, I'm approaching North Vashon from the west, and then I call in and went on tip of North Vashon, because that's where the reporting point is on the chart. And then the controller I spoke with um, said, oh, you're supposed to report in, Kate, he said something like three miles west or before you get there. Or to, some it was like one out of probably a hundred times I've done it, and I was just wondering if there, there's what's behind that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe okay. he was busy at other traffic out there that he was trying to call traffic to. But that's not some. Normal but that is the it's marked on the chart, and that yeah, is right. the correct yeah, reporting that, that, that's point. That's okay. I just was wondering if that had somehow informally shifted where you call up when you leave the shoreline uh, to the west, or no? Okay. Yeah. I was actually told, I believe, by somebody from the tower, this was years ago, not to call in way before that. That you know, wait until you're actually at at, at uh -huh. that you know the north north Ashon tip. And I will confess that you know I've I've flown to Boeing Field for many years, and uh, once or twice when the frequency was just super congested on a busy day, I got there and I called in inside of North Ashon, and I never got yelled at for that. Uh -huh. So our radar, we uh, we only ranged out so far. You know, the further out we ranged out. The really the less we can see really tight and most people do about a 12 mile range around Boeing Field so if you're calling 70 miles away we're going to tell you to report a much closer point we get a lot of people from the northwest or 20 miles out on a report shell show so we'll do that I expect you to do your own scene avoid till then north batch on as well and that sounds like an isolated case where yeah somebody was. was somebody was flustered <laughs> <laughs> yeah this has been really good Thank you. Really good. I, I, I admire you guys, uh, or everybody actually. Uh, the people people that you're trying to capture probably aren't here in this room or in, in, other, in other presentations. Um, and it, it is about that coping technology and uh, adapting uh, or making the technology. Or is it people adapting to technology or the other way around? Or which way should it go? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I really appreciate you taking the time to put this together and, and conduct these uh, presentations. Sure, you're, you're certainly more than welcome. I really, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with everyone. And so, uh, like I said, please, please take the message out there that that one these are out there. There's some things we can do. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, spoke with Aaron and Matt earlier, and they're going to be hopefully firing back up Operation Rain Check. So I'll be watching uh, for that as well. Sometime, hopefully, in the very near future, over at Seattle Approach Control. But uh, certainly, the, the more we can get the word out, the better we can make the system for everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Thank, Thank you. Yes, you're going to good questions. Well, I thought so. I'll take a chart. Yeah, my piece. My piece. Yeah, Charles. Pleasure. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I fly around here all the time, so. Yeah. 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 Yeah.